you know, not to be distracted, just to be able to talk through. And by all means, add your questions in the chat box and we will, um, we will do our best to be able to answer them. So I'm going to introduce Tim. Um, I met Tim in Mary I last October. Uh, Tim was over for a, um, for a year in residence at UCD, I believe. Yeah. Uh, he, and he was their uh, lecturer in residence on Irish American history and studies. Now, Tim has written several books there. He has written um, The New York Irish and Inventing Irish America. And he has won the James Donnelly Prize for the best book in Irish and Irish American history. I believe that was The New York Irish or was that Inventing Irish America? And both. both. Okay. So that's, yeah, that's quite, and, and they're fantastic books. Um, if you haven't read them, they're really well worth reading. Um, Tim was a, um, an associate professor of history and an archivist and curator of the American Catholic history collections at Catholic University. And his specialty is the history of Irish Americans. And, um, Tim's book, Inventing Irish America, is very interesting because it looks at a particular place in Massachusetts and it follows the stories or the, the incoming Irish immigrants. And he'll be talking using his own personal experience in um, his own family research and telling us about, um, about that. So um, without further ado, I think I've covered everything. I hope I have, Tim. I'll hand over to you. Okay. Um, uh, well, thank you very much for inviting me. This is supposed to happen in March, and uh, yeah. you know that all hell broke loose everywhere, and I had to get out of town, as they may say in Las Vegas and Nevada. Um, uh, so uh, uh, came back to the United States, and so we're doing it now. But I hope, uh, glad that everybody's doing okay. I hope you're doing okay, staying safe. Um, I'm going to talk about. Uh, uh, family history in a broader context, see if we can put it into a broader context. Um, I'm gonna talk about, I think it's helpful uh, for people who do family history, but it's also helpful to learn about the broader context that their people might uh, uh, operate in and the broader context of the historiography about what historians say about uh, Irish experiences. But on the other hand, it's also very useful for historians to hear uh, the kind of individual family experiences. It's a kind of rich, it's kind of close uh, to what is actually happening. It's a way to get right at uh, kind of real experience and it's really important. But in any case, that's what I'm gonna try and do is set this into context. Um, I'm gonna use my own family here. Uh, I recently, uh, I've been working in my family history for a while. I know most about the uh, McDermott's who are my mother's, uh, my mother's grandfather and the uh, Mahars, my father's grandfather. Um, but I've also learned about the others. Uh, I've got eight grand, great grandparents and I found out that all eight uh, were famine Irish immigrants, all left uh, during the famine period, which I uh, define roughly between 1845 and 1860. Um, one seems to think uh, she came in 1862 and another guy thinks he came in 1861, but this is off the 1900 US census, so you never know. They never really know exactly when did we come here uh, sometime. So, but it's really in the famine uh, time period. And I sent out a crib sheet um, to you, and I hope you got it, you know, and you have them there. Um, but they come from all different parts of Ireland, from Tipperary, Mahars from Tipperary, Foley's from Kilkenny, uh, McMahon from Clare, uh, Belly Vaughan maybe, or Milton Mulvey, okay. I don't know. I don't know enough about her uh, yet, but I've, I've uh, narrowed it to that. McDermott's from Louth, from Belurgan, just outside Dundalk. Uh, Hagen's also from Louth, far, uh, just outside Dundalk. Um, Lobbins, I think, from Roscommon, and the only one I don't know is uh, Mary Kennedy, who married Patrick Lobbin, and I don't know exactly where uh, she came from. I've been trying, and anybody has any good suggestions about it, I'm trying to find out where uh, locate uh, origins. Uh, as you know, that's one of the most difficult things to do in doing genealogy, for at least from the American side, is to make the jump from America uh, back to Ireland, to find where people are from in Ireland. Um, 
So, I, and I know more about some of these people than I do about others. I know more about the Mahars and the McDermott's because those are the people I started with. I've also visited those places where they came from as well. So I'm gonna address a number, a number of questions, you know, kind of broad questions. Um, uh, why did they come? Um, the famine obviously uh, uh, pushes people here, uh, but uh, I'm also interested in uh, whether they were vulnerable to the famine, what happened before the famine, what happened to these families before the famine. I got into a couple of them and they found some interesting kinds of stories because we have an Irish uh, economy in Ireland. <clears throat> it goes through some tough times after 1815, between 1815 and 1845. How do they come? And, and this is part of the why. I mean, you come because you know you can come. You know where you're going. Um, I'm not so much interested in the journey here, uh, although I think that's interesting. And I, you know, plan on uh, if this ever becomes a book, as I've kind of dreamed about lately. Although it took me a long time to finish the book, I'm still working on. So you know, we'll never know how how much time I'll have. But um, uh, but one of the things that is interesting to me is the is the is uh, not just the journey the, 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 whether you can get here whether there's ways to get here, but uh, ships to get on to get here, but also networks chain migration which is uh, kind of an ill refute to a certain degree among some people in in the United States now but is common from everybody and it certainly was common uh, for Irish immigrants but. Uh, largely for any poor people in particular, uh, dependence on chains, dependence on networks of friends and family to get here. So I'm interested in that. Um, how do they do? How do they get on when they are in America? How, are they economically successful? How successful were they? What kind of jobs they get? How do they get those jobs? Um, when do they marry? You know, we know Ireland has, in the 19th century had a kind of particularly interesting kind of uh, family marriage and family system or regime, demographic regime, late marriage. Lots of people don't get married. Um, does this happen in America? Uh, mortality, uh, I mean, uh, and the kids, the role kids play in the fam uh, families, their families. And then also mortality, which is, seems like a depressing topic to bring up, mortality rates, but it's important, I think. It's important. Irish American historians know about it, but don't often talk about it. And we really don't know really what it means because Irish mortality rates from the famine for immigrants, or from the famine into the 20th century, and even for American-born children of Irish immigrants are pretty high uh, through uh, that. Uh, now, I'm going to talk about the famine, but I'll talk about the other period you know, people want to talk about. I've been writing a book about Irish American history from, from Raleigh's colony in Roanoke, North Carolina in 1880 and uh, 1585 up until 1960. So I, I uh, have some knowledge and experience about uh, talking about um, any of the other time periods uh, uh, that you want to uh, talk about. Okay, so that's what we're gonna, how we're going to do this. Um, and I'll start then with why they come. Um, as, you, as I said, uh, the famine, obviously, uh, uh, we know that the famine is not the same, as, as terrible as it is in so many places, and uh, nearly universal in, in Ireland, but not entirely. But it, uh, it, it, it strikes or it uh, has an impact differently in different places. Uh, uh, some of you probably, uh, probably all of you know Ignatius Murphy's book on the famine in West, uh, West Clare, um, which I had looked at, thought it was really interesting, the whole uh, 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 impact of evictions following the new poor law, and then uh, uh, the number of people who are uh, actually waiting in poor, in, uh, in poor houses, uh, workhouses, waiting uh, for people to send money so that they can come to America. Very kind of interesting. Um, I'm not going to talk about the famine in these different places so much. I'm kind of interest, more interested here in what the families were going through before the famine. Um, um, we know, as I said, that uh, uh, Ireland uh, was in trouble after 1815. Prices plummeted for uh, all sorts of agricultural goods, stayed low uh, through most of the period. It was really a wrenching, gut-wrenching kind of economy uh, for lots of people in Ireland from 1815 to 1845. Two of the things that were really important that I think that I thought would be relevant to the people I uh, study or my family. Uh, one was the contraction of linen. Linen had spread throughout 
Northern Ireland, even into Southern Ireland during the Napoleonic Wars, uh, lots of people were making linen. Um, in the 1820s and 1830s, uh, it begins to contract again into East Ulster because of the mechanization of the linen industry uh, begins to contract. And so these other places are really hurting, which were dependent on linen. Um, the, for those people, things and other kinds of things. Um, uh, the prices plummet, uh, they try to hold on, uh, and, but a lot of landlords are pushing them, uh, try to get them off the land so they can uh, 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 leave it off for pasture, leave it off for cattle and cows. Um, and so there's a lot of tension uh, around that. So I think this has, I thought these uh, changes would have some impact on the two families that I know most about, uh, the McDermott's and the Mahars. Uh, the McDermott's, uh, I thought, uh, were affected by linen. In most, both cases of the McDermott's and the Mahars, they seem to start out relatively well off in the 18-teens, 1820s. Uh, for the McDermott's, uh, I was able to get into uh, the landlord, land, uh, uh, the uh, landlord's papers in uh, at what used to be called Prony. I visited when it was Prony. Mm -hmm. It is still. It's UK, uh, Northern Ireland. Um, and they had the landlord papers, the tipping papers for the, for the estate that the McDermott's were on. And in those rent rolls, they had a few of the rent rolls, the McDermott's had paid very high rents. They had to pay the highest rent of anybody on the rent roll um, in, the, uh, in the estate. Uh, but they were in, in severe arrears in 1825, paid a rent of 25 pounds a year or in severe uh, arrears. Um, uh, 1840s, uh, the uh, amount of rent they pay has gone down. Maybe they've lost some land already, uh, but their arrears have gotten worse. There's also a kind of glitch thrown in here. My great grandfather comes from Louth, will leave from Louth, but he was born in Dublin because his parents went to Dublin for a little while had him, and then came back uh, to love. So what's going on here? Uh, there's a lot of instability, kind of difficulty uh, going on here. Um, I thought it might be linen. Um, there's a great article. In, uh, and one of the things I guess I wanted to say is you know this already, but this, uh, Ireland is great for local history and has some great local history journals like the um, uh, the Louth Historical and Archaeological Journal, uh, I guess it's called, uh, but it's a great uh, 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 article on the area in which my people come from, the Flory Valley uh, in Bergen in the uh, Carlingford Peninsula, uh, just outside Dundalk. And linen was really important there. It was important in almost every estate, however, except the one where my people were. Uh, and I can't connect them to linen. Um, there's, Evidence on the property that suggests a lot of uh, ruins or still used uh, kind of small buildings, uh, outbuildings may have been connected to a kind of linen, but there's no way in which I can connect it to it. So there is this depression for them, this kind of um, these kinds of problems for them, but I'm not sure my original uh, um, explanation of linen didn't seem to work. Now, the Mahars also uh, run into trouble. Um, they uh, also seem to be rich uh, to start with. Um, in uh, the 18 teens, 1820s, they seem to have about 60 acres, uh, maybe more than that, uh, of land. Uh, the, my great, great, great grandfather uh, owns the land at that point, uh, even has enough money, pays two pounds, two pounds 50 for a, um, a uh, seat uh, in the Catholic chapel. So he's doing pretty well. But then he divides the land up. The inheritance gets divided up among three of his sons. Uh, two get about 30 acres or more. One uh, kind of gets it in the neck, who happens to be my great great grandfather, Michael. He only gets 17 acres. Uh, it's 17 acres in the early 1840s. By 1845, it's 12 acres. By 1847, he's evicted. Uh, for the uh, um, McDermott's, same kind of problem. They're unstable, they uh, have difficulties, uh, they run into the famine, uh, they uh, run into real troubles. It's hard to uh, trace them. They disappear, they're not even on the Griffiths valuation. Uh, so I can't even find them there. By the time I can find evidence of them again, maybe in the late 1850s, early 1860s, they're in a joint tenancy with another family. Um, they have lost the, the relatively nice house that they lived in, a two-story Georgian house 
uh, that they lived in, that has gone to the other tenant, the other joint tenant. Uh, they moved into a kind of cottage that is next to it. Um, and they also are dividing this land, uh, 30 acres uh, between them. Um, so they were invulnerable. They were vulnerable, got hit by the famine. So did now the, the Mahars, were, uh, Michael Mahar was vulnerable and got hit by the famine. I have no real information on the others. Um, uh, I don't know what happened to the Higgins. I don't know what happened uh, to McMahon, Sinclair, uh, the Kennedys. I don't know where Kennedy was, Mary Kennedy was from. And I don't know right now uh, about Patrick Lavin uh, and his family. I just haven't, he's from Roscommon, but I just haven't traced him yet. Uh, so I haven't been able to trace all of that. So our next question is, how do they come? And as I said, I'm interested in the journey. Uh, you know, I know that, the, for example, that the Maha and McDermott's, <laughs> excuse me. I know, for example, that the uh, McDermott's um, and, and Hagen, McDermott and, and uh, Henry McDermott and Bridget Hagen were married in Louth. There's a story there, a very suspicious story about why they had to maybe got, had to get married, possibly. But they got married in Louth, and then they left. They went to uh, took a steamer to to uh, uh, Liverpool. Um, uh, the uh, Mahars uh, also seemed to leave uh, from Liverpool as well. Uh, uh, McDermott's went to uh, New York. Uh, the Mahar went to um, uh, Boston. Uh, so I'm interested in the journey, but I'm also interested, particularly interested in Ben Industry as an historian in, uh, of immigration generally, and in Irish immigration in particular, about chains and networks, chain migration, and the importance of chain migration in uh, the whole process of migration. You don't go if you can't get there, if you can't get uh, a ship to take you there, but you usually don't go unless you know something about where, what's going on there, if you've got connections that connect you to there. Um, especially if you're poor people or you don't speak English. Uh, so you see, for example, in America, a lot of the, the people from Irish speaking areas, uh, the, uh, the people from the Blasket Islands, for example, tend to concentrate in uh, a place like uh, Springfield, Massachusetts, or people uh, from a little town outside of where I come from in Worcester, uh, uh, from uh, Lewisburg in Mayo, uh, go to Clinton, Massachusetts, go to Clinton, Massachusetts. Uh, a lot of these are kind of very far western places where uh, there are speakers, but poor people in general, and everybody uses uh, uh, migration chains. Um, uh, you know, Irish American and, and the history historiography of Irish immigration to America, uh, we often talk about the Ulster Scots coming to America. They come first in the 18th century, come in really big numbers. Some of the talk about that is, well, they're more modern people, they're more smarter, and so it's, it's almost a kind of racial kind of suggestion that they're better than those kind of dumb uh, Irish Catholics who didn't know that they should have got out of, got out of Ireland. Um, but one of the big reasons they come is because the linen industry creates a migration network that brings them to America. Um, uh, linen is, uh, the linen industry in, in Ulster gets very tightly connected to uh, ports in, in, in the United States, particularly Philadelphia, and helps bring them uh, to America. So that whole process of the migration chain, and that builds what historians and sociologists call a migration machine, something that builds a momentum by itself, and then will just keep sending people because people are now familiar, they know they know where they're going. They know what they're going to get to. They also know that there are people there that they can meet up with and connect to in, in the United States. Um, we also know that the famine migration, there is uh, chain migration. We know that from the kind of concentration of famine immigrants in uh, places in the United States. So concentration of people from different counties in Ireland in specific places in America. Newburyport, Massachusetts. Half of the Irish in Newburyport, Massachusetts come from Cork. Cork sends a lot of people, so there's court people everywhere. But this, in this case, they're half of the people. The other, about 15% more, are from uh, Kerry. Uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, North Cambridge, uh, about 60% of the people are from either Cork or from uh, Kerry. Uh, the Five Points District, the Lower East Side in New York, famous book by Tyler Anbinder uh, on the Five Points. Um, they are from Kerry. Uh, and Sligo, although also Cork, again, Cork, uh, heavily. And there are other people in these places, uh, but they're kind of heavy migration. 
Uh, the Kerry people are particularly interesting because a lot of them come from around Kenmere, the Lansdowne estate in in, uh, in uh, Kenmere, in the first in the uh, the, um, uh, the uh, closest uh, uh, to the mainland uh, part of uh, the uh, Bear Peninsula. Um, the Bear Peninsula is interesting because if you go to the other end, you go to the very end of the Bear Peninsula, those people are tin miners. And later on in the uh, 19th century, uh, they will go to the United States and become copper miners in Butte, Montana, a kind of famous Butte, Montana. I have an, uh, a notion uh, that the people kind of in between, the people around Kenmere and the, uh, the, the uh, eastern parts of the Bear Peninsula uh, are going to New York. There's a Kenmore Street in New York, but there's also those people in either there or a little further out uh, that are going to Newport, Rhode Island. I've talked to some people in Newport, know that their families came from the Bear Peninsula, know also that in Newport, they have a, a contest in the year uh, over the, uh, I don't know if it's over the night best looking or the smartest or the most highly achieving Sullivan or O'Sullivan in Newport. Um, uh, Sullivan and O'Sullivan being a Bear uh, Peninsula uh, kind of carry name. Uh, so we have these kind of concentrations of people uh, going that indicates to us that people are living in chains and winding up kind of in the same places. Um, we also know, uh, have evidence that suggests that people who go further west, however, uh, there's less concentration. So the chains might not be quite as important once people get uh, uh, to the United States and, and go to the west. Uh, in fact, a lot of the people in the United States who go to the west actually come uh, and settle in the United States on the East Coast and then make their way slowly, sometimes taking years to get across uh, the country out to the Midwest or further out uh, to the West. It's very different for German immigrants. German immigrants land in New York and then go right away in, in, into the Midwest. But for them, it takes a while. And so um, what I'm saying is that those old world con connections networks may be a little looser, less important as they move uh, further to the West. The famine immigrants have a particular problem because uh, the, thing, the uh, problem is uh, uh, the famine comes on so quickly and is not expected and is so stunning and so powerful that they have to scramble to get out of town. They have to scramble to leave, to leave Ireland. And they don't necessarily have people already in Ireland. They weren't planning on going to Ireland. So in a lot of cases, they have to send people over like a pioneer, one of the brothers, one of the sons, uh, maybe the uh, mother and father will go over first and then send for the rest of the family. So you will find in a lot of you know, places like Lowell, Massachusetts or in New York, you'll find a lot of, um, of people listed in the, in the uh, censuses of incomplete families. I mean, there's a couple of people, but not the whole family. And they're trying to bring the whole family over. This can be a really dangerous process in some cases. Uh, Kirby Miller tells about um, two uh, great historian of Irish America, tells about a couple of uh, 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 brothers named O'Malley from Mayo. What other name would they have in Mayo? But O'Malley, maybe Philbin or something. But in any case, these two O'Malley brothers go to America. One uh, tells people, uh, you know, uh, at home, uh, talks, uh, uh, is in contact with people at home, um, uh, uh, sends letters back, and eventually comes back to Mayo, rescues his uh, uh, <clears throat> his wife and kids. The other one gets lost in America. They never find out about him. They lost all kind of contact contact with him, and his wife and children uh, actually uh, starved to death in their Mayo cabin. Uh, so it can be dangerous, but it's a uh, what they have, it's the possibility they have. So in my case, the front, the uh, I, uh, McDermott's, uh, James McDermott, Henry McDermott, my great grandfather is Henry McDermott, James McDermott, his brother comes out early uh, and sends back letters saying, please come, you should come out to uh, uh, the United States. It's better here, you, should, you will do better here. Um, there's a story and Henry follows him and follows him to where he is in Auburn, Massachusetts. There's a story that's family lore actually got printed in a, a, a family biography in one of the county histories of uh, our city histories of Worcester uh, about uh, uh, James is up on a roof in Auburn on a barn, roof of a barn, fixing the roof. And he's looking down and he sees 
his brother Henry down the road, walking up towards him. So it's the first time he's seen him in five years. He doesn't know, hadn't known whether he'd ever see him. He sees him and he, and he kind of comes down off the roof and goes running down the road and, and says something, you know, uh, not particularly interesting, like, hi, how are you? Uh, but in any case, it's this greeting. It's just, it testifies, I think, to the importance of that and remaking that connection or remake uh, that people remember that uh, ever after. So James and Henry McDermott creating this kind of chain. Um, uh, Khan in the Mahars case, same thing. They're all evicted. All of the, all of the children uh, uh, of Michael Mahar will come to the United States and his wife will eventually come to the United States. But uh, they also follow a kind of chain process or at least my uh, uh, immigrant uh, great grandfather. Uh, yes. Brother go Worcester in 1850. People they've been evicted since since 1847. Uh, eight years later, he comes back to a uh, temporary back to Moyne and picks up his brother, my great grandfather Dennis, who is has different ages and different sources, but uh, uh, apparently is about 16 years old at that time, and also another brother who's slightly older than that, and brings them back uh, to the United States. One of the things that's important here, kind of interesting and makes things complicated, is that not all people, even from the same family, will go to the same place. There may be another chain that goes to another place. And in my family's case, the Maher family, they go to Worcester. My father, uh, great grandfather goes to Worcester. My great granduncle Khan goes there. And another great granduncle goes there. But other uh, brothers in the family go to Missouri, go to St. Louis, which uh, has a big uh, temporary uh, contingent, very big monster contingent, Kerry, but also Tipperary. There's a ward in St. Louis where almost all the people in that ward are from Tipperary or German. Uh, there are no other Irish in that ward, Ward 2 in St. Louis. So they are going to St. Louis. And then there's another contingent that I think goes to Worcester and then goes on to Chicago eventually. Eventually, they all come back for a reunion just before my great grandfather Dennis dies. Or they he goes out to meet them, all of the all of the siblings. Um, uh, but there is this process where some people don't necessarily go to the same thing. And it's complicated, but it's not random. So for example, uh, there used to be on the, one of the ancestry sites, a really interesting study somebody had done of the uh, people who left from Castle Gregory in Kerry in the, um, in the late 19th century. And the, if you looked at the data that the woman or the man put up about that, uh, most of those people went to either Holyoke, Massachusetts or Chicago, Illinois. Uh, I've lived in Chicago. I'm from Massachusetts and I love Massachusetts, but I've lived in Chicago and I think I would have rather gone to Chicago. But in any case, it, it suggests that people are going in uh, different kinds of streams. Um, I couldn't find much about the women who migrated. I found more about the men. Uh, Bridget Hagen, who had married uh, Henry McDermott, obviously went with him uh, before they left for Ireland. He went, went with him uh, to the United States. But um, I did find that Maggie, uh, um, Maggie Foley, Margaret Foley, uh, did go with her whole family. Her father took everybody uh, to the United States, which must have been pretty expensive. Uh, but I don't know much more about that. It takes, it takes them to the United States, winds up in Grafton, uh, Massachusetts. But I could find nothing on the McMahon, uh, Catherine McMahon, who comes from Clare, or uh, on Mary Kennedy, who I just still don't know uh, where Mary Kennedy came from. So the next question, uh, the next series of questions I wanted to address was, uh, had to do with um, how do they do in America? Uh, what, what, how do they get on in America? Uh, are they successful economically? Um, historians have a kind of big debate about this, uh, about how well or badly uh, Irish immigrants, famine Irish immigrants do in America. Um, uh, some studying occupation, occupational mobility, you move from a lower class job to a higher class job, say they don't do very well. And the data seems to suggest that, that the occupational mobility is not very good. Um, it's not nearly as good as the Germans and the English immigrants who come. Um, in addition to not moving up very quickly or very often, uh, they tend to fall uh, once they do move up more than the English and the Germans. Um, others say, well, no, but they uh, <clears throat> managed to save a lot of money. Cormac Grada and uh, uh, Tyler Landbinder have done a lot of work on the Immigrant Savings Bank in New York um, and looking at 
uh, savings accounts say, well, even if they're laborers, they're saving a lot of money. Other people point to property acquisition, which is easier to do in some places than others. Can't, it's not easy to buy a tenement in New York. It's really easy to buy a little bungalow in Chicago. So uh, more Irish people, uh, immigrants own their own uh, home in Chicago uh, than do in New York or even in Boston. Um, so those are, the kind of, those are the kind of controversies in terms of the historiography. In my family, uh, they do relatively well. There are two who become saloon keepers, uh, uh, Mahar, Dennis Mahar, and Michael Ron and uh, William Ronane. One, uh, McDermott, Henry McDermott, becomes a, a fat farmer and then a tanner. And the worst uh, outcome is for Patrick Robin, who becomes a laborer in a wire mill and stays a laborer in the wire mill uh, for his entire uh, life. Uh, let's start with him, how he gets that job, because this is kind of interesting and, and uh, it goes along with what I've talked about in terms of networks and chains. Um, I was looking for him. I knew he was a laborer in the wire works. I checked the city directory for him in Worcester, Massachusetts, and found him there and found 24 lobbins in the city directory of 1878. Seven of those uh, lobbins, seven of the 24, worked as laborers in the wire mill. Uh, two more also worked in the wire mill. So clearly they had a connection and a network into the wire mill and into actually becoming laborers in the wire mill. Uh, in addition to that, he and his family had taken in uh, his wife's brother, so his brother-in-law, uh, Patrick Kennedy. And when he's living with uh, uh, the Lavins, he also works in the wire mill and he will work in the wire mill for the rest of his life as a foreman in the wire mill. So there's a clearly a kind of connection, a building of connections and a network uh, there. Uh, the McDermott's, uh, as I said, James invites Henry to come, to come uh, to the United States, tells him to come. When he does come, they both settle down in Auburn. They both settle down as farmers. I don't think they own the land in common, but they think they may own land uh, that's uh, next door to each other. Um, uh, and they farm for the next 30 years after Henry gets to uh, the United States, gets to Auburn, Massachusetts. Um, when uh, James will die uh, early in the early 1880s, Henry will move into the city, uh, into Worcester, uh, and I think also in part because his, his kids want to move into Worcester because their work uh, would be better in Worcester. So they, uh, he moves into Worcester and he uh, says he works as a tanner, although I think uh, he largely lives off the, the kids. Um, and um, there's also an interesting connection, a lot of coincidences, a strange coincidences. This is, I guess, the glories of doing family history, all these kind of strange thing, phenomenon uh, uh, come up. Maha and Rodin both were by saloons. They'll buy them not too long from each other, not too, uh, one will buy Maher will buy, Dennis Maher will buy his saloon in the late 1870s, uh, William Rodin will buy his in the early 1880s. But they also had been boot and shoe workers together. They had been part of the same union, the Knights of St. Crispin, which was a big union, uh, shoe workers union in Massachusetts in the 1860s, 1870s, and thus part of a big strike in 1870 uh, by the Knights of St. Crispin. They also both fought in the Civil War, uh, although in different regiments and in different branches of the service. Uh, uh, Dennis was a cavalry uh, man and became a corporal in the Second United States Cavalry. And I could talk about the Civil War if you would like later on, Irish in the Civil War. And uh, William became uh, was an infantryman uh, in the 15th Massachusetts uh, Infantry Regiment. So there are all these kind of coincidences, but the biggest one is but John H. Mahar is Dennis Mahar's son. Dennis Mahar's son, John H. Mahar, marries Ronane's son, Ronane's daughter, Margaret Ronane. So there's some kind of connection between these two, forged somehow through all this process of similar work, union, maybe as veterans, uh, and uh, eventually uh, saloon, opening saloons, uh, connections. So connections and networks are built. A lot of them come from the old country uh, par uh, and parts of the old country, uh, loyalties and allegiances, uh, friends and relatives, uh, but they are also built in uh, the United States. Now, in terms of work for women, uh, I only found uh, Maggie uh, 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 Foley. Maggie Foley was a domestic. Uh, I found her as a domestic about five years before she married 
1870. She married in 1870. She was a, a domestic in 1865. Excuse me. In North for a young Yankee family with a couple of young kids. Uh, the census uh, calls her uh, Maggie J, identifies her as Maggie J. Now, I don't know whether that's what the uh, uh, the parents in the family called her or whether the kids had started to call her that. Um, she's about 20 years old, uh, but that's how she's identified there. But I could not find uh, work for the other two. Uh, 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 Catherine McMahon from Claire and uh, Mary Kennedy, uh, I'm, I'm not sure where. Uh, Kennedy may have come well, only a couple of years before, uh, she may have come uh, just a couple of years before she got married. So she may not have uh, worked. So when they, do they marry? This is a kind of important era, issue for Irish American historiography, important for Irish historiography as well. We know, as I said before, that Ireland has a, bad, uh, has a trend towards later marriage and people who don't marry late uh, as the uh, 19th century unfolds. This is also a regional trend, however, stronger in the East uh, and only later in the West uh, does this happen? In the United States, there's less reason for immigrants uh, not to marry. Uh, they should marry. Uh, they're not going to inherit land. There's no reason to hang around and wait for to inherit land. And they, because there isn't much occupational success, up, occupational upward movement, uh, they might as well get married, have kids, and have those kids work for them. Uh, the family economy is really critical to a lot of Irish immigrants, particularly poor Irish immigrants in uh, the United States. The kids can help uh, maybe even make the family prosperous while uh, the, the father still works, but they're also useful, uh, particularly useful for old age. So, and this is true uh, uh, for uh, kids, uh, for families like the uh, Lavins in, um, in, uh, in, in, in the United States. Uh, they have a couple of kids uh, who, uh, Patrick Lavin and, and um, Mary Lavin have a couple of kids who stay, sons who stay, both of them are plumbers, bringing in good money. They're still living with their parents into as late as uh, their late 20s, probably after their late 20s, bringing in money uh, to the family household. The Mahars have three uh, uh, kids who are still uh, their adult kids are working, uh, bringing in money uh, to the family in 1900 and probably after that. Uh, the McDermott's have five kids. Henry McDermott and his wife Bridget have five kids, working kids, uh, and adult kids who are bringing money. One in particular, my great grandfather, who is uh, my grandfather, who is moving from being a carpenter, a successful carpenter, to being a contractor, will eventually become a major contractor in Worcester. And so, but he's also living at home until he's into his 40s and 50s. And so this is, uh, this kind of family economy is really important. I should say, to go back to the marriage, I skipped over the marriage uh, example here, when they marry. Two of the families marry early. The, the uh, McDermott's and McDermott and Hagen married in Ireland and they married in their, in their early 20s. Uh, so did uh, Maher and, and, um, uh, uh, and Foley uh, marry in their early 20s, 23, 24. Uh, the Ronanes and Maupin seem to marry kind of later in their 20s, uh, late 20s, uh, 28 or so. It's hard to tell with McMahon because uh, I have uh, so little information how old she was at exactly when she got married. Um, the Lavins, who were the poorest and came from the um, most uh, further west uh, of all these people, uh, they married later than anybody. They married uh, in their 30s. Uh, they're, so they're hard to fit into a kind of regional pattern of, of, uh, of Irish marriage. So it's not entirely clear why that is, but in any case, um, they did. Now, uh, last point, uh, I want to talk about uh, mortality uh, for uh, all of these people and the importance of mortality, uh, importance of mortality for Irish immigration uh, to the United States. Irish uh, immigrant mortality rates are really high. They're higher than any other immigrant group. And not just in the famine era, all the way up into the early 1900s. Uh, in the early 1900s, Irish mortality rates in New York City are about the same as African-Americans. They're a lot worse than Italian -Amer recent immigrant Italian-Americans or Jewish Americans or Polish Americans and a lot worse than, than uh, German Americans. Um, and so immigrant mortality is, is tough. Also, uh, 
American-born mortality is tough. Second-generation mortality is also worse than a lot of other groups. The thing that kills Irish immigrants, the epidemics, cholera in New York, yellow fever in uh, New Orleans, the climate, the tropical climate in New Orleans, the yellow fever kinds of diseases, no immunities. Um, uh, but the thing that really kills them almost everywhere is tuberculosis. They are really severely hurt by tuberculosis. Tuberculosis becomes the Irish disease, the Irish American disease in America. Um, and it, uh, it slaughters lots of Irish Americans from Lowell, Massachusetts to New, uh, New York or Boston. John Hughes, Archbishop John Hughes, who is the uh, Archbishop of New York, says that tuberculosis, tuberculosis is the natural end of the immig Irish immigrant in America. Um, so it's really devastating for uh, Irish uh, immigrants and also for their kids. All of these people, however, uh, relatively long lives. Uh, most of the immigrants that I've talked about, Foley, uh, Hagen, Lavin, Kennedy, um, uh, die in the early 1900s. So they've been in the United States, for, uh, they're 60 or 70 years old uh, when they die. The only one who doesn't is Ronane. Ronane, I think, got injured in the war or got sick during the war. And that might have been uh, led to his discharge early discharge in 1862, and he dies in 18, in the early 1880s, I think around 1884. Uh, so that may be a, a part of his, uh, uh, a legacy from his um, Civil War uh, life. But mortality hurts these people, these kinds of problems of illness and other kinds of problems, uh, health problems. Uh, infant mortality is really big among Irish immigrant mothers. It's uh, the famous Annie Moore, some of you may know Annie Moore, um, the Irish immigrant uh, Annie Moore, who is kind of, a, and there's a statue at Ellis Island for her, supposedly the first uh, immigrant uh, to step off uh, the boat into Ellis Island. It's not clear that that's true, but she lost several children in childbirth. Um, so did my grandmother, great-grandmother, uh, Maggie uh, Foley, uh, who married Dennis Maher. She lost several children. She lost four kids in childbirth. Um, she also lost two uh, who uh, before the age of 25. Uh, the others, uh, the kids seem to last longer, seem to have longer lives. Uh, but James McDermott, who was Henry's brother, five of his six kids died uh, before the age of 30. Um, so this is a, in some ways, a, uh, a great story, a story, a triumphant story, a story of of uh, success uh, in lots of ways, but it also has its tragic tragedies. It, it also has its uh, hardships and that kind of mortality is one of them. Thank you. I'm ready to answer any kinds of questions. Okay, I'll, I'll hand that over. Th thank you, Tim, That's that was excellent. That's very, very interesting what you've covered. Um, does anybody have any questions? And if you do, would you please start typing them in the chat box um, there, which is at the bottom of the screen. I, I wanted to ask a question, Tim, what is the, the most recent book? You mentioned at the beginning that you have a book. Do you have a book coming out, another book coming out? Well, I hope it's coming out. I mean, I've been working on it for a long time. Uh, it's a, a general history of uh, Irish in America from, <clears throat> from Roanoke, uh, 1585, Raleigh's colony in Roanoke, where there were Irish people. Okay. And wow. the first, uh, colony on North America, uh, you know, Roanoke off from the North Carolina coast up until uh, 1960. Okay. If Irish Americans, it's basically, a, it's for Yale you know, University Press if they still take it. Uh, it's basically a kind of traces how they change, they adapt, and how the meaning of who is Irish and what Irish means, Irish American means, changes over time. So for example, in the um, in the colonial era, uh, Ulster Scott people don't really call themselves Irish no. in the colonial era uh, until uh, about the time of the revolution. And then they start to call themselves Irish uh, along with uh, Catholic Irish. And from the revolutionary period, from the American Revolution through 1815, uh, that what I would call the revolutionary era, including the rebellion of 1798, from that period, uh, there is a kind of uh, emergence of a kind of Irish American identity, but it's a non sectarian one. It includes Protestants and Catholics. People don't say uh, an Irish American is a Catholic, they say an Irish American 
is an Irish American. People of Irish ancestry can be Catholic or Protestant. Their enemies will uh, say they are mad Republicans. They're crazy Democratic Republicans. And that's how they're vilified, but not on, in terms of religion. Then in the 1840s, when you get a new big uh, Catholic migration, and then in the famine migration, Irish begins to be defined as Catholic. And Irish Protestants begin to drop out here, not defining themselves so much as Irish anymore, uh, not wanting to, uh, uh, to necessarily collaborate as they had before with uh, Irish uh, Catholics. And uh, they begin to drop out. They will take on the name Scotch-Irish, but there's no real formal infrastructure for uh, an, an ethnic identity called Scotch-Irish. Some group, uh, some people try to create a uh, Scotch-Irish society in the United States in the late 1880s and early 1890s. It lasts for about 10 years and then it dies. Um, and the orange order doesn't uh, work in America because it's too closely connected to Imperial Britain. It works in Canada and it works in Australia, but it's too closely connected to the British Empire to work in the United States. So they kind of drift into, Irish Protestants drift into this kind of Protestant, white Protestant mainstream. Okay. Mm, about that, interesting. And it's also about politics, a lot about politics. Okay, too. which is always interesting. Yeah. Uh, I think there's a question there, Larry, do you wanna? Yes, uh, Ron, are you there? He's, he's muted, but okay. he's- Okay, that's yeah. fine, I'll ask the question then. Uh, Tim, uh, Ron from, uh, I'm not sure, sure where, where, but he says, did Vermont attract many people from Clare? I'm running into certain Clare lines Weedy and McMahon in Rutland County. I think a local quarry may have attracted them to Rutland before they moved on to Minnesota. Would you care to comment? Yeah, I, I would, but I don't know. Uh, basically, I don't know a lot about, and that would be interesting to me for if you guys could tell me where there are Clara settlements, because I haven't found a lot of them. I know there's a big settlement of Clara, Clara people in, um, coming Clara people in, in Toronto, a really big one. And there's a good book on Toronto about the Irish uh, Catholic community there. What interests me here about what, he, what uh, Ron is talking about is that there is a big migration of people from Roscommon to Rutland County in Vermont. Uh, some of you may know about Bally Kilcline. Do you know, anybody know about Bally Kilcline? The, oh yeah, I read the book. I got the book now. I actually got yeah. the book, yeah. Yeah, well, they, uh, there's two books. There's an old book on their life in Ireland called The End of Hidden Ireland by Bob Skelly. Mm -hmm. And then there's another book that is, uh, what's her name, Duffy, maybe, no? Um, yeah. Uh, and they have, a, they have a society, actually, the Bally Client Society. Yeah. They took off their land um, by the uh, British government because they hadn't paid their rents, in part because nobody asked them to pay their rents for a long time. And it was a major court case, so there's a lot of data about that. But um, the second book that you have traced them to uh, Vermont. Uh, and to the uh, quarries in Vermont. And they uh, uh, get established there uh, in those uh, quarries. Um, so that's a good book about this. And it may have, and the woman, uh, I'm, I'm, it's Mary. She, uh, yeah, Mary, the one that wrote Valley Kill Klein. Mary Dunn. Yeah. Mary, Mary Dunn, Dunn. I said yeah. Duffy Dunn. She, Dunn. May be able, she may be a good resource to find out if there are Claire people there as well. And she does a lot of genealogy, so she would know. So it would be really, but they're really interesting to go there. Um, they're very active. They create a, a parish there. Uh, they um, they uh, uh, have a big uh, uh, group of Fenians there. Um, there's a, a book by a guy named Leon Fink who talks about the Knights of Labor, a major American labor union in the late 19th century. He has a chapter on the uh, Irish in Rutland, Vermont. He doesn't know they're from Valley Kilcline, uh, but he knows that they are uh, union workers. They are very strong union workers, and they take over the, uh, the town meeting and the town government in, in Valley Kilcline. So they were really in, uh, in uh, Rutland, Vermont. So they're really interesting. So there may have been clear people who went as well. Uh, there are other uh, um, Roscommon people who go to quarries down in Maryland as well as as, as uh, Vermont, but I don't know about the Clare people who go there, whether Clare people go there. I would like to know about McMahon. That would be maybe a, a hint at what I'm looking yeah, for. I know, I I know there was a group of Clare people that went to Newtown, settled in Newtown, which is just outside of Danbury, 
And I also know that there's a group of um, a number of, of Claire people that settled in New Haven and in the Hartford Weathersfield area, oh, really? oh. as well as and Cuyahoga County in Ohio was another. Yes, big I've area. heard that. That's the yeah. one I was thinking that, but I couldn't remember exactly. But yes, I've heard in Cleveland. Yeah. An interesting question from uh, Mary Stanley. Hi, Tim. My family came from Clare to Melbourne, Australia in 1860s, but the question is relevant to Americans. On the death certificate of great-great-grandfather, it lists several children who predeceased his arrival in Australia. So how might I track these named children who must have been born between 1832, the supposed marriage date, and the arrival in Australia in 1864? Well, uh, again, maybe you guys would be better, you know, because you're probably trying to find them in Ireland um, and not in the United States. Um, so I think, you know, probably uh, whatever Irish sources you think, uh, you know, would work in particular in terms of Claire uh, might be uh, might be important here as well. I'm trying to I was trying to look at some uh, Irish sources for Claire as well for this woman, Catherine McMahon, and still have had no, no great luck uh, doing that. I can say, uh, and this is not the question you asked, and I'm sorry, but I'll leave it open to others to kind of offer some uh, advice about uh, finding those people. Uh, that a lot of people from, particularly from Munster, uh, Claire and Tipperary in particular, wind up in Australia. And a lot of them, as you know, are uh, involved in secret societies, uh, uh, the kind of nightly wars uh, going on in those places, terrible tip. The, uh, the uh, place where my uh, great grandfather Dennis comes from in Moyne is really uh, ripped up by secret society warfare uh, all the time uh, through uh, the uh, from the 18 teens right through into the uh, into famine times. A lot of these people get sent to uh, uh, transported to Australia. In fact, in the cemetery in which uh, he, his people, my people. Uh, are buried in in uh, Moyne and in uh, in um, Tipperary. There used to be, a, or there still is, a little marker that said, um, "In memory of all the men and women who were transported to Australia from this town." Uh, so there's a lot of people coming out of those places who get uh, to Australia. Uh, but I just don't know uh, to find out those other people uh, who predeceased him. Uh, I think it would be finding uh, Irish sources before he's. He's, uh, he, he migrates. It sounds like if he's leaving in 1864, he's probably migrating rather than being transported uh, as a prisoner. Um. Okay, uh, another question from Ghislaine. Uh, I have a book uh, on the Irish Texans, 1995, that may be of interest to the attendees. Can I show the cover? Of course you can. Sure. Irish Texans. Is it called land? Uh, can't quite see it. Ghislaine, can you lower it, please? There you go. That's better. Yeah, it's called the Irish Texans. Oh. And the Irish were pretty active in Texas from, from in the beginning. And they focused in cities like San Antonio and Corpus Christi and mm -hmm. Refugio and so right. on. And they also fought uh, for Texas independence from Mexico. Right. Wow. So uh, there is, um, this is put out by the Institute of Irish Cultures. Of Texan uh, Cultures. Sorry, of Texas, Texan Cultures. Right. Uh, and they have an exhibit there of the Irish as one of the Texan cultures. Right. That's well, great. Uh, there is another book by a guy named Davis, Graham Davis, about called Land, which is also about the Irish in Texas, and he, uh, it's mainly about that first, those first colonies, which are from Wexford, and it's a really detailed and interesting uh, history. Um, how they're recruited by they're recruited by the Mexican government, which wants to bring in um, more Catholics um, because there are all these. Uh, yeah. Protestants who are coming from the southern United States who want Texas to be uh, part of, well, they wanted either to be independent or be part of the United States. And so they're recruiting these Irish Catholics uh, to go to uh, from Wexford. It's a very uh, 
sad story because they get shipwrecked and they get disease and all sorts of things. But they do wind up there. And basically in the two places that are the place that you noted, Refugio, and also in San Patricio's colonies. These are the yeah. two colonies. Right. Right. Kind of uh, uh, Gulf Coast in Texas, and most of them, in, well, they kind of divide. Some in one of the colonies, I can't remember which, are a little more pro-Mexican during the war, uh, yeah. but the other is pro totally yeah. uh, pro-Texan. Yeah. 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 And so they, oh, yeah. in terms of their support for the war, but they oh, last. The the Irish conquistadors. Uh -huh. Conquistadors. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> But some of them become huge, uh, um, uh, have huge uh, cattle farms in Texas. Uh, one to get, 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 remember who his name is. I think it's O'Brien, but I'm not sure. Has a huge uh, Texas uh, uh, cattle farm, uh, 80,000 acres or something like that of uh, a cattle farm, um, which is a lot more than he probably had in Wexford before he got there. Is that the King Ranch? No? I think so, yes. And, he, and what's interesting too is the, there's a kind of mix of, uh, of cultures, uh, Irish, but also culture, and American culture in uh, how they, uh, the, kind of, the kind of culture they carry on. It's a very interesting episode, very interesting. Jim, have you time for a couple more questions? I got as many, much time, I'm not anything, I'm retired. Yeah, not so much a question, <laughs> but I think a point of information from Patty Waldron. Uh, uh -huh. Just saying, there were major chain immigrations or migrations from West Clare to Sandy Hook, Stroke, Newtown, Connecticut, I think it is, and, yeah. and Jackson, uh, Michigan, or Maryland, Michigan, Michigan, to Michigan, and to Detroit, Michigan, and to Devonport, and to Crawford County, uh, Iowa. 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 Yeah. Patty, would you mind, would you could be unmuted uh, muted and make a comment there? They're mostly people from around Kilkee, Dunbeg, Carrigaholt area, right out in the Luped Peninsula. And there was typically a major employer they were going to. There was a tire factory in Newtown, Connecticut. There was a prison in Jackson, Michigan. And the strange thing is Crawford County, Iowa, I think most of them ended up farming rather than going for um, any sort of industrial employment. Did they, did they go? It was a, ch a chain migration from the same area to Argentina. Yeah, really. Yeah, yeah. Did they go serially, or are they, is Crawford County the last stop uh, for people, or is uh, is uh, there was a group who went to Germantown in Philadelphia, or maybe it was oh, yeah. outside Philadelphia. It's in, in the city the now. Yeah. and some of them went on to Crawford County. Oh really? Oh okay. Yeah. Well, there's good studies of, uh, I don't know of clear people, but there's good studies of the Irish in Iowa um, in the 1860s and 70s and later. Uh, uh, there's a study of, uh, uh, but it, uh, it, it's, it's a study of migration in, in general. Um, and I'm uh, blanking on the uh, historian right now. I'll send it along later. Um, but he talks about Limerick and Cork people. Uh, and actually, they, the story is uh, they settled in the same county, and um, uh, the uh, court people come first. And a lot of people are kind of hostile uh, uh, to new Irish immigrants. And one uh, native stock American, Yankee American, says uh, uh, to one guy, he says, are you from Cork? He says, no. OK, well, he says, I'll sell you the land. And he says, well, I'm from Limerick, <laughs> you know, so he didn't know that he thought everybody from Ireland was from Cork, so he was out the land. In any case, they have a big fight. The Cork and Limerick people have a big fight over what the name of the, of the, uh, of the uh, town is going to be. And it's named after, uh, I should remember this, I can't uh, offhand, but they uh, eventually the Limerick people went out and the town has, has, a, has a kind of named after a town in Limerick. Um, Gary Owen, no? You know, there are different resources to this, but the more recent migration sounds like the one to uh, Hartford and Newtown that Jane also talked about. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of it's a, a fairly recent migration in the yeah, um, late, Danbury, late 19th century, early 20th century. Into the 20th century. Danbury, they all worked in hat factories. That's right, yeah. yeah. 
It's a huge, the hat factory in, in oh, yeah, hats, yeah. Hats. and that, and that grew them to Norwalk as well, which is yeah. a little bit of what I'm doing. Yeah. yeah. Right. There's a big Supreme court case about the Danbury hatters mm. and humans and stuff like that. So, I think yeah. there was one family, the Delucaries, and one of them ran a big hat factory and the other was the head of the hat workers union, two brothers. Oh, really? <laughs> That's great. That's great. Uh, one more uh, here, Tim, please. Uh, sure. Doug Burnett, uh, my O'Brien family came from Clare to Lynchburg, Virginia. I've yet to figure out what the attraction was. Any idea? Yeah, I don't. I mean, it depends. When? When is it? I don't see that. Doug, could you maybe be unmuted there and just ask the question? Or answer the 1850 it looks like oh okay um well i mean uh, one of the things would be just uh uh, uh people uh would be railroad work um work on uh, canals or railroads um canals probably not in the 1850s or into railroads by then in the 1830s and 1840s uh, almost every place you go in the midwest or even like Worcester or Lowell, uh, the first work people in Irish to get there are construction workers, uh, like often canal workers, but later railroad workers or building uh, construction. Um, so that's a possibility, building a railroad. Um, there are Irish in Richmond. Um, there'll be some Irish from Richmond and also Eastern from Alexandria who will fight in the Civil War on the Confederate side. Um, they mainly stay in the cities, Irish who go, um, but they do. Uh, participate in these, um, um, uh, they go out, uh, they use the cities as a kind of labor, become labor depots, and they go out from those cities to work on on uh, projects throughout. So there, if there's a railroad uh, construction going on, that would be my, my best guess. I mean, so this is actually going on like in Wisconsin, uh, Janesville, Wisconsin, those are railroad people, uh, who are Irish people who go Gainesville, Wisconsin, um, you know, and then there's others, uh, Jacksonville, Illinois, those are railroad people go to Jacksonville, Illinois first because they're railroad construction people. There's another possibility, but it doesn't seem like 1850s. There is an um, effort, I just found out about this, a friend of mine who's a colleague at, uh, at George Mason University, very good historian, uh, just a book on Chief O'Neill. Does anybody know Chief O'Neill of Irish music, traditional music? He wrote a big compendium of Irish traditional music. Anyway, this friend of mine, also his family uh, moved to um, Pennsylvania uh, and to the coal fields in Pennsylvania. The priests in the coal fields in Pennsylvania uh, began to send, try and send people to colonies in the South uh, to gather them together and buy land for them and send them into the South. And one of his uh, members of his family was sent on one of these colonies and wound up in Virginia for a while, then came back to Philadelphia because he couldn't stand it in Virginia and came back to Philadelphia. So that's another possibility. But um, I would guess more of the railroad one. All right. Tim, I have one that relates to myself, that relates to your presentation. You mentioned two uh, ancestors who went into farming. Yeah. Uh, uh, was that the New York or Massachusetts area? It's in Massachusetts. Uh, you know, to buy land, especially in the New, New England area, where it was less plentiful, uh, would have taken some means. Could yes, you it talk would. About how they probably would have been. What about that? You know, that's a. No, go ahead. No, just how they would have. What about that? Would have taken some means to buy land. Yes, absolutely, and that's the main reason a lot of people, uh, Irish people, do not do it uh, because it does take. Uh, it's a it's a really uh, expensive, and it's easy, even expensive if you get further west, where you get you know, land prices might be lower, and then and eventually you can homestead whatever. It's still expensive even if you're homesteading, you get the land for free. But but yeah, this is surprised me um, because it's 20 acres for James A. and uh, I mean not James A. for Henry, and uh, 10 acres for Henry uh, for James. That's 30 acres in Auburn, Massachusetts which is probably, I'm not sure about, I don't know the, uh, I've done a book on Worcester, but I don't know the ne neighboring town of Auburn's economy real well, but I would guess that it's pretty expensive land. So I don't, I, uh, when I looked at that, I usually look like looking at it today, I was thinking, how did they come up with the dough to buy this land? Which 
was said to be uh, by the census in 1880, uh, uh, Henry's land was said to be worth $1,200. So um, James A. had worked on a farm, uh, not James A., James, had worked on a farm um, before Henry got there and so may have accumulated some savings. I was wondering in the, in the chaos uh, in your family in Ireland, whether there was some kind of buyout maybe, you know, between brothers or something, I have no idea because I really don't know what's going on until they come out with this joint tenancy at the end. Um, but uh, whether there was some money left from earlier, uh, how they how they managed to do that. Uh, uh, or whether James uh, may have not have, have bought the farm right away, they may not, he, he and Henry, uh, James and Henry may have all both worked as tanners, you know, tanning hides. Uh, and uh, accumulated some savings, and then kind of worked uh, that way to uh, to buy the farmland. But that's a that's a really good question. There are other farmers um, in Massachusetts, but not a lot uh, of or in New England. Yeah, it occurs to me, uh, Tim, that too in America, it's not that uncommon for the seller to carry the mortgage for someone who's buying, which yeah. is most uncommon here in Ireland. You don't ever hear of it. Well, I haven't heard it. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so that would have been a possible means for someone to have access to land. Yeah. Yeah. It could be that he, somebody he worked for, that James worked for, um, yeah. you know, wants to get rid of this land, uh, wants to, you know, his kids want to move in the city or whatever, uh, has, has some other kind of enterprise going on, would, would do that. What's interesting is they held on to that land um, through my grandfather's time up until the 1920s. Um, my grandfather, James McDermott, uh, was very successful, owned a lot of property in, uh, in uh, Worcester, um, uh, but then owned a lot of property in uh, Coral Gables, Florida, um, in the great Miami land rock kind of uh, time, uh, mortgaged all of it. Uh, the Miami property went down. He mortgaged the Massachusetts land uh, property to support the uh, the Miami property, um, and then when the crash came in 19, uh, a few years later in the 1930s, he lost all everything. He lost all of it, so they lost that land too. Um, but my mother remembers uh, going out to that land as a kid in the 1920s and and working on the farm. Uh, so the grandfather James uh, uh, still held on to that, and they would, you know, uh, work on the on the farm, uh, go out from their house and. In Worcester, but that's a great question about and that, uh, those rural uh, Irish, those uh, farming Irish, not just in, in those in New England, but those even any everywhere in the country have been neglected. Uh, they're not uh, cl as closely followed or studied as the urban Irish who have attracted all attention. And there's good reason. I mean, the Irish are largely an urban people for the most part. Um, uh, even relatively early on, especially certainly by the uh, by the famine migration, and certainly even more so after that. So, but it's a good question. Okay, Tim, I don't see any more questions. Mm. You've done a good job. Yeah, thanks very much, Tim. It was very, very interesting. Really enjoyed okay. that. Very, very okay. good. That's uh, great. Well, if anybody has any other questions, I'm happy to. And if I have questions, and if anybody runs across Catherine McMahon, born 1834. I have some info for you on that, but anyway, I'll yeah. send it to you tomorrow. Yeah. Well, and her mother yeah. was yeah. Margaret Breen. Breen, Catherine. yeah. She's from yeah. Milltown Mall Bay. She's from uh, Milltown okay. Mall Bay, yeah. yeah. All right. So, anyway, well, that's great. Yeah. Well, I appreciate it. It's great to okay. have a connection to Ireland after six months. So um, I was very happy to do it. Yeah, thanks very much. And I, I know we did get, um, we, we intended on having you in March in person, but it's great to have you in October on Zoom. So I'm delighted you were able to do that. And um, I really appreciate that. Um, anyway, I'm just going to, uh, two things I know I have to mention. I, Dolores had reminded me there just before we started, we will not be taking membership dues this year due to the pandemic. So um, we are gonna take a break from, member, from membership dues just for the year uh, because we will be having our meetings on Zoom um, certainly next month and into 2021. Um, and I just wanna remind everybody that next month's meeting, Ghislaine is here tonight. She is going to be speaking on Zoom about the no-no family 
who lived in Ennis for many, many years, a very well-known family that were very involved in music and entertainment. And Ghislaine has written a book about them called The Notable No-Nos. So that should be very, very good, uh, very interesting um, for anybody that uh, has Ennis roots or remembers this family, which had a long history in the, um, in the Ennis area and a very interesting history. So um, I think without, I think we're probably done. Um, thanks very much, Ron from Minnesota. And um, for the other people that came from Las Vegas, Nevada, and uh, from other places, Florida, Doug's from Florida. So that's great that we've had this international audience that's been able to hear Tim tonight. Um, anyway, I think we'll finish the meeting. Thanks so much, Tim, for coming sure. um, on to Zoom and good to see you again. And I'll be telling Una that um, I yes, met you. Listen, I'll be in touch you. With you, you got home safely from that time when you <laughs> probably the airports were crazy that weekend trying right. to get everybody out of the country. Um, and we're still struggling with COVID here, unfortunately, but right. hopefully things will get better. And um, anyway, everybody, um, good night, stay safe and well, and we'll see you on the uh, 19th of November, okay. Thursday, the 19th of November at 8 p.m. Um, and we'll send you out. I think the link will be the same, but we'll send that to you in um, just before that meeting takes place. Anyway, thanks very much.